من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم مصطفى محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to this third episode of this brief series of shows in which we're discussing topics which I think are particularly important, which have been inspired and are very relevant to this period of time in which we are commemorating the martyrdom of the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi namely Fatima to Zahra. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her and her father and her husband and her children. Of course, it's very important when we look at the martyrdom of Zahra, when we look at how society engages with the martyrdom and the period of martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra, to understand that we live in a time in which doubts, in which skepticism is on an all-time high. We see that the people are skeptical of pretty much everything these days. And so we find that today we would, it, I believe that those who are particularly devout and religious Shias would be hard pressed for those who reflect, to not know at least one person that has expressed doubt about whether or not Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam was physically martyred, about whether or not her house was attacked. And more importantly, I believe that this doubt is normally couched and cushioned and veiled in a particular unique way. From my limited experience, it's normally asked with, uh, yeah, but are those reports sahih? Now, of course, I'm not talking about a Sunni asking these questions. I'm not talking about someone who's been raised to love Abu Bakr or Amr asking these questions. I'm talking about whether or not this is a common phenomenon within Shi'i circles. And I believe that this particular approach is one which is all too common within the contemporary Shi'i community, particularly with friends who are from both the Iraqi and Lebanese communities. Now, again, we have certain golden rules that I want us to all remember to apply here. And one of them is to always think the best and assume the best about the one asking the question. It's very easy for some of us who have grown up in certain families and some of us who have been in certain circles some of us who have read certain books, to assume that everybody is on the same page or on the same wavelength and everybody has read the same things as you, been taught the same things as you, and have the same emotional leanings and respect for the same people that you do. That's not the case. And we all need to be familiar with the fact that we're not looking at things from the same blank sheet of paper. We're looking at things with very different lenses. And so those who often do doubt this occasion, they're not doubting because they're enemies of Islam. 
They're not doubting because they're enemies of Tashayyo. And they haven't brought forward the doubt because they want to make excuses for Abu Bakr or Amr. It's not, they're not bringing forward this doubt because they have a love for Abu Bakr and Amr. Because a lot of the time, the people who have doubted this event when I've spoken to them, have made it very clear that they hold the mainstream Shi'i view on Abu Bakr and Amr. So we have to be fair. We have to acknowledge that sometimes there is a tendency to doubt. Sometimes there's a desire to know what the truth is about these accounts. And it's not always cushioned. And it's not always going to be caused by a desire to have a reproachment with Sunnism, nor is it done out of evil, malicious intentions to deny the martyrdom of Zahra. And that brings me on very briefly to another side topic. Brothers and sisters, know that this is a topic which is solely historical. That is to say, we're not looking at aqeedah at the moment. This discussion is a historical discussion. We need to be aware of that. We need to know that when it came to the whole launch of an attack on certain historical figures for certain historical figures, no, certain near contemporary Shia ulama for their views on this, for their mistaken views on the tragedy of Fatima to Zahra. One of a few individuals who did not write a letter of open condemnation due to his akhlaq was Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi, the writer of Minfiq al-Zahra. Instead, he felt that the more befitting way to respond was to write Minfiq al-Zahra. Because we don't need to give someone a label. There's no need to judge the intentions of someone just because they've got a mistaken view. We need to learn the adab, the etiquette of disagreeing with somebody. This is really something that we all, and I'm talking about myself primarily, need to learn. So dear brothers and sisters, the topic for today in relation to those friends of ours who might have doubts about whether or not an event has occurred is what is the methodology of Muslim scholars when discussing history? And today I'd like to focus solely upon the methodology of Shi'i scholars. I'd like to discuss what is the methodology of Shi'is when it comes to discussing history. Now I know that there's some humorous individuals out there that might say, well they have no methodology. Well, that's not the case. We're, today we're discussing whether or not very diligent Shi'i researchers when it comes to the science of history have applied a very rigid standard in which we even need to start hearing things like, is it Sahih? Of course, the word Sahih to mean strong. In the context of history, does not mean the same thing as it does in the context of Hadith. We need to understand firstly that when it comes to studying history, we do not apply the standards of Hadith. And to apply the standards of hadith to the standards of history is akin to being like those arrogant New Age materialists out there who will claim that the only valid forms of knowledge come from the empirical sciences of chemistry, physics and biology and that the only true facts are physical facts. And the only knowledge that can be gained is from those physical sciences. And in doing so would try to come up with a physical theory for objective morality. When we look at such individuals, 
with their arrogance. In trying to be so reductionist, we need not to do the same thing when it comes to looking at history. Now, I know that there's some out there who might say that, well, you're saying this in order to be defensive and apologetic. I don't believe I am. And I do believe that this distinction was one that was noticed by scholars throughout history, including the Hadith scholars themselves. But what I'm going to do right now is just cite some of our ulama who have made this distinction and have made it very, very clear that when it comes to the study of history, we don't apply the standards of Hadith. Sheikh al Alama Muhammad Hussein bin Sheikh Ali bin Muhammad Riva bin Sheikh Jafar al Kabir, who's known as Al Kashif al Ghita, he states in his response, which is a response written to certain questions asked about a particular issue. He states in his response to this, Naam, yes, Khabar Zayd bin Arqam wa ibn Waqida kalahuma fi ba'd al-kutub al-mu'tabara. Yes, the report of Zayd bin Arqam and Ibn Waqida they are both found in some of the reliable books. And then he goes on to state, وَالْمُرَادْ هُنَا الْإِعْتِبَارَ التَّارِيخِي لَا الْإِعْتِبَارَ الَّذِي أَلَيْهِ الْمَدَارِ فِي الْأَخْبَارِ الَّتِي يُسْتُنْبَتْ مِنْهَا الْأَحْكَامِ الشَّرْعِيَةِ من الصحيح Wal Hassan Wal Muwathaq. And here, when I say that these books are reliable, I mean by that the reliability of history, namely, reliability in the field of history, not the reliability upon which there is the practice of utilizing the word etzabar in the reports that we use to derive Islamic law from Sahih and Hassan and Muwathaq. So of course, just to explain and unpack these terms, when it, within the science of Ilm al daraya when we look at the complete isnad of something, we would conclude that it is either Sahih, which means fully connected and narrated by individuals who are all imami, and Thiqah, or we would say it's Muwathaq, where we look at a, a chain of narration which is fully connected and is all narrated by people who are either imami or considered reliable but might not be imami, but they're all nonetheless reliable people in the chain. Or the chain may be Hassan, which is a fully connected chain of people who are all imami. When I say imami, of course, I mean Shi'i but are nonetheless, not necessarily thiqa, but every single one of them is praised and praiseworthy. Anything that falls short of these classifications is classed as va'if, namely weak. And weak doesn't necessarily mean fabricated, it just means it doesn't pass the bar which we need it to reach in order for us to derive laws from it. In most cases. Now, there are certain exceptions to the rule, but today is not a lesson in the reliability of narrations for the perspective of deriving fatawa. So, Kashif al Khatta points out that the report is considered reliable, and when we say reliable, we mean the reliability that we require for history and not the reliability that we require for passing a legal judgment or deriving laws. Said Muhsin al-Amin, 
of course, the famous writer of the book, Ayan Shia, he says something which is very similar. He says, Laysa marja'an lil ahkam al shari'a hatta nabhaf an asaniduhu wa nausiluhu ila Ali alayhi salam. Now, of course, he's talking about Naj al Balagha. And he says, Innama huwa muntakhab min kalamihi fil mawa'iv. والنصائح be sanad wa bi ghair sanad so in saying that najul balagha is not a book in which we use to derive fiqhi laws he says therefore we don't need to look up its isnads in order to know that this all goes back to imam ali and why is he saying this he's saying this because he wants us to know that when it comes to the book Najah Balagha, we're not using it to derive laws. And so we don't need to use the same rigorous standards of history in order to know that this book goes back to Imam Ali. Rather, we would look at it as historians and we would use different criteria to the one that we use for looking at fiqhi reports. Of course, this is not only found amongst Muhsin al-Amin and it's not only found amongst Shia scholars but today because we are focusing upon Shia scholars I'd like to look again at something else which has been stated by someone who I believe the Rajaliyun out there from the Shia and I believe the scholars of the Hawza the Khutaba those who are familiar with the position of our scholarship would know the person I'm quoting is not a small fish and is not someone that should be dismissed as being an irrelevant nobody as far as looking as as far as looking at what Shia standards are in analyzing historical reports. And that is a Sayyid Al Muhaqqaq Ayatollah Al Uvma Zaim Hawzat Najaf Abul Qasim Al Khoi Qiddus Allah Sirru, who states, and by the way, this individual is considered to be the reviver of the strict Ilm al Rajal methodology in the Shi'i world. He states in his Mu'jam, after looking at the profile of Jabr ibn Abdullah al Ansari. وفي هذه الروايات وإن كانت كلها ضعيفة and in these reports and regardless of whether or not they are all weak إلا عن جلالة مقام جابر واضحة معلومة ولا هاج معه عليها except that the maqam of Jabr ابن عبد الله الأنصاري is something which is wadah, it's clear, it's ma'luma, it's known. And there's no need for us to have sahih reports. And even if all the reports we've just looked at aren't considered sahih sanadan, it doesn't matter. Because that's not how Sayyid al khui does history. And again, in the profile of Amr, Ibn Hamak al Khuzai, Rahmatullah alayhi, he states the following In ma tukadim min al riwayat wa in kanat kullaha vaifat al sanad illa innaha mustafiva ala inna jalalat amr ibn humak min al wavahat alati la shak. 
and even if that which we previously presented from the narrations and even of all of them are weak according to Senate, according to the chain of narrations, except that they have now become mustafiva. Mustafiva means that they've been narrated so plentifully. It's from the clear issues. The fact that this man is great is something that cannot be denied. And this is something that doubt cannot affect. مضافاً إلى أن شهادة البرقي على أنه كان من شرطة الخميس فيها كفاية. In addition to the fact that Al-Barqi, who is one of the Rajal scholars, has said he was from the religious police of Amir al -Mu'mineen. Now, this goes to show that the Shia scholars, when it comes to analyzing history, they don't apply the standards of hadith. They don't apply the standards that we would use to derive rulings. Now I know that this might seem weird for some people and some people might be wondering why don't they apply the same standards. Well the honest fact is that when it comes to measuring anything we use the standard which is designed for that thing. It would be inappropriate to handle diamonds with the same equipment which is used to handle for example metal. It would be inappropriate for us to use a calculator as a means of communicating with a mobile phone. Even if a calculator malfunctioned and allowed us to use it for that purpose, that would never have been the purpose of the calculator. And so why would you utilize something which was never designed for the thing it's used upon as a means of measuring that thing? We need to be very clear that when it comes to the issue of history, when it comes to looking at what goes down in history, this methodology of using only Sahih Isnads is not the methodology of the Shia scholars. I'll show as well that it's not the methodology of the Sunni scholars either. But we need to understand that when it comes to these things, we do need to take a stand. We do need to make sure that people today don't come along and straw man you and say that, look, your reports aren't Sahih on this. Well. That's fine, because our ulama never said they had to be sahih in this field. You're coming up with a canon of evidence which is not what we would expect when looking at that particular field. We need to understand that when it comes to using the four divisions of sahih, hasan, muwathaq and va'if, this is designed specifically for fiqh where we're attributing laws to Allah Azawajal. Of course we're going to use the standards of rigorousness. But when it comes to understanding history, we can't be expected to apply those standards of rigorousness. And the ulama never did. Not even the ulama who would tell us to apply it here. So for example, I don't want to be surrounded the bush. The ulama who might question the incident of the door who are Shia, someone might want to come forward and go, well, they were being consistent because you see, they didn't want to accept for something that wasn't, according to them, Sahih. Well, that's fine, except that in some of their other fatawa, they would likewise use narrations which don't meet their own standards of being Sahih and would be extremely Shah positions. So, we need to be quite clear that sometimes there is an agenda going on. 
I remember one of his students of probably the most famous rejector of this incident. His student is still alive today in Lebanon. Um, his student, I forget the, the surname, but the first name is Yasser. He has entire commentaries on certain du'as, du'as like du'a kumail. And yet he'll come forward and deny the validity of every other du'a which contains things which he doesn't like. And he'll say, bring me a sahih, a sanad for that. And yet when it comes to du'a kumail, he won't have that sahih, a sanad. Now, I'm not judging him as being outside the madrasa. I'm sure that he's a very intellectual man. I'm sure that he's done a lot for the Shia. I'm sure he's done a lot for humanity, in fact. And may Allah bless him and bless all of our ulama and guide all of us too. What I'm questioning here is whether or not we are playing inconsistent with the evidence. We need to be consistent with the evidence. And this is the only way which will be able to break past some of the problems which are affecting us today. You see, when it comes to whether or not we as Shias should accept the event of a door, and whether or not we should believe it actually genuinely did happen, there is numerous reasons for us to believe it did. But most importantly, we have to understand that we should not come up with new principles in order to deny things we don't like. We shouldn't all of a sudden raise the standard of evidence that was never previously there and act that this is the Shi'i standard. Because that would be being plain dishonest. And we need to be honest and we need to be consistent. Because the Quran has stated that if this book were from anyone other than Allah, you would find in it much inconsistency. Why? Because inconsistency is a hallmark of humanness, is a hallmark of falsehood. We need to be consistent because our religion demands consistency. So my brothers and sisters know that when it comes to analyzing history, our ulama as Shia have had very different standards. Now, all this has done has negated the fact that the ulama of the imamiyyah have not used the standards of hadith in history. It's a very different question as to whether or not the ulama of the imamiyyah have accepted this event. And that's something that we'll discuss in another episode inshallah ta'ala. I just wanted this particular point to be made clear to the viewers because I want the viewer to stay away from this dilemma of thinking whether or not something has to be sahih by the standards of ilm al-daraya in order for us to believe it has occurred. When it comes to history, that is not the case. Dear viewers, I'm going to leave this point here and join me in the next episode in which we continue to discuss this point but looking at the Sunni scholars and what their standards are. Hava wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahla bayta al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-masumin al-mablumin. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته فاطمة يا زهراء